the discovery of this fort um, was quite remarkable because we have very little evidence of the Sasanian presence in Oman. We have historical material that supports that, but this is the first archaeological indication of it. And the, site, the fort appears to have been built in around the 5th century AD. And then it carries on being occupied into, it's reoccupied and transformed in the first decades following the Islamic conquest of Oman. And this small and, and, and somewhat modest site, I want to explain later how I think this actually links very closely, remarkably closely, with this much broader story of the formation of the Islamic polity of Oman. <coughs> the project itself is a collaboration, research collaboration, between Durham University and Sultan Qaboos University. And we're very happy to have that, that close association with, with the university out there. And um, it, it came, the project came into formation in 2015. At that point, it was part of a European Research Council funded project. We did two seasons of excavation. Um, that came to an end. And then, <coughs> thankfully, we're now supported by the Anglo Armani Society to go back there and continue the important discoveries that we made. Um, I'm very gra grateful for that support. I want, to, I want to spend probably the first half of this lecture, actually, giving, not talking specifically about Falange. I want to look much, cast the net much wider and think about the significance of, of why it's there, and especially this Persian presence in the late pre-Islamic period in Oman and how we should understand that. I want to give you the wider context of Falange. And actually, that wider context is not so easy to provide. Um, because there are, as I said at the very start, this is the only site, this is the only archaeological site we've found so far of this period in the whole of Oman. So, to provide the broader context, I really need to talk about events that came after, immediately after the occupation of Falage, and I can also take you back in time to what happened in the run up to that, and, 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 and hopefully you'll have a clear idea from then. So the most obvious thing that happens in the period immediately after the occupation of, of Falange is the blossoming of the port of Sohar. And I don't know if everybody's aware of this because Sohar carries on having this long occupation that carries on even to the modern day. And it has the Portuguese fort that was built there and the Hormuzi fort and all of these later stages of Islamic development which probably are more famous and widely known. But underneath that fort is a huge settlement mound that belongs to one of the most prominent Islamic period sites in the Middle East. It was a huge port in the Indian Ocean, um, and this site <coughs> blossomed at the time, um, in the 9th and 10th centuries, at a time when there was a huge expansion of trade across the whole of the Indian Ocean, with contacts being made with China, East Africa, India. And this kind of blossoming within the heart of the Islamic Empire under the, the, the Abbasids, um, when there's this sort of flourishing of culture. And Sohar was the linchpin of that. And all of the shipping that was coming back towards the Gulf was putting in at, at Sohar as the, the key destination. Um, <clears throat> we're quite fortunate that one of the first people that was, became interested in, in Sohar and the history of it was this man, Andrew Williamson who um, I've done a lot of work around, uh, around his, his, his involvement. He was the first director of antiquities in Oman. He went out there in 1973 when they set up the post um, to start to kind of formalize the arrangement for excavations. And he did two years of work in, in Oman. And he had previously been working in Iran and doing these very wide surveys along the coast. And he had a very particular insight and a very, very modern insight into how, how to approach a city like this, which wasn't necessarily to dive in and, and start to dig an excavation. His first instinct was to map it, and to see the extent of it. And we're very lucky that he did, because um, as you can see in these photos, the condition in 1973 was the city was barely developed at that time. Since then, it's been covered in an urban sprawl. Um, <coughs> No, 
So he wanted, so he did this survey of the of the um, of the, the, the environments of, of Soha, and what he mapped was this settlement which covers over 73 hectares of mounded occupation. And it's quite interesting, actually, what you have at Soha is a city that was built out of fire bricks. This is quite particular. It's quite specific to the region. And it's one of the things we probably need to be aware of when we compare cities around the Middle East is to think about their, <coughs> their locale. And um, in this case, it was built out of fire brick. So you have this um, small-ish settlement mound, and then with Barasti architecture, really built houses stretching out beyond that. And if we consider Soha in comparison to its closest comparator, which is um, the port city of Siraf in, in southern Iran, which was also occupied at the same time as the other part of this axis of, of Indian Ocean trade. But Soha, the architecture is built out of solid stone. And so you have this ruined field of 250 hectares, very large ruined field that survives in this very impressive architecture. And I suspect what's going to happen at Soha, as I'll come on to much later, is that because it's made out of bricks, this would be reused. It's a highly reusable material and will carry on being recycled and incorporated into the later forts. <coughs> there was an excavation at Soha in the early 1980s, first half of the 1980s, by a French team, by Monique Cabron. And they did good work. They, 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 they went there. The, the, the ambition was to try to find the pre-Islamic origins of, of Soha. And it is mentioned in, in the sources of the time as a foundation before um, the advent of Islam. So they had the specific aim of trying to uncover that and did these very deep excavations eight meters down into the stratigraphy of the site and um, found the sequence which they then dated to the Sasanian period, the period I'm going to be talking about. But we have been looking at that material again. We've gone back to look at the pottery and revisit it. And unfortunately, um, the, the chronology isn't correct. It's, it needs to be revised. Actually, the foundation is really in the around the 7th or 8th century AD, the beginning of the Islamic period. So nobody has found the pre-Islamic um, city of Soha. But we do have this important material. So the city of Soha itself is, it sort of looms, mass, looms large in the early Islamic period. And if we think about the broader landscape, what's happening, the other thing that, um, that um, Andrew Williamson did was do an extensive settlement survey across the hinterland of Soha and um, started to, you know, to think about why, why was this location so important? Why was it so prominent in the early Islamic period? And there are a few reasons. One, it is very well connected through the Wadi Jizi through to um, Bahraini and, and Alain, which were the key sort of administrative centres in that period. And the other really important reason is this concentration of copper resources in the Hajar Mountains. And as you see on that map in the middle, there are, there are a sort of wide distribution of copper, but it's majorly concentrated in the hinterland of Soha. And this was a key resource exploited since the Bronze Age and widely, you know, widely required and, 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 and in demand. Um, I don't think Soha could have existed purely from the export of copper, but it was certainly a key resource and export. In terms of continuing to think about the pre-Islamic um, pre um, origins of this area, we do now fortunately have quite a lot of um, survey work that has been done in the area. So um, there are three, three surveys I've indicated here. There's one that was, um, I should say, I suppose, um, Andrew Williamson, unfortunately, he lost his life in Dofar in, in 1975 in an accident. So actually his impact was, was, was short-lived in, in Oman. And if he had lived, then things would be very, very different today in terms of our archaeological knowledge. Um, but the people who took, took over the reins after that was um, this survey, the Soha Hinterland survey, 10 years of work. In the, and what they found behind Soha was this huge agricultural expansion, irrigated agriculture. And um, you can see from the shared scatters that this belongs to the period of Soha in the 9th and 10th centuries. 
But what they didn't find was any evidence of pre -Islamic, late pre-Islamic occupation in the Zohar hinterland. Likewise, Williamson found one shard of, of Sasanian period pottery from the Zohar. <laughs> so so um, it's limited. And then we have much more recent work. We have this work of the um, Wadi Jizi survey from Leiden University. They've been working there for nearly 10 years. Um, very good, modern, modern piece of, of, of survey work. Um, and then another project which was, again, generously sponsored by the Anglo Mining Society, the Rustak project by um, Derek Kennett, which is there to the south. And these two big survey projects um, <coughs> provide a lot of extra information. One thing that I'm sure all of you know from, from, from being in Oman, living there, is that the landscape is littered with these um, burial mounds, thousands upon thousands of these burial mounds along the edges of wadis. And these burial mounds go far back in time, back into the, the Bronze Age and even to the, to the Neolithic. But the major concentration of them is from the Iron Age, these quite simple tombs like we have at the bottom here. And up until now, there hadn't been much work on these tombs in, on the Batana. Most of the work on the sort of funerary archaeology of, of Oman had happened further south, around Nizwa and, and other places. But um, one of the things picked up um, by those two survey projects I talked about is these late Iron Age tombs, so built in the, the tradition that had existed for a very long time in Oman, but with later finds of glass that belong to probably the, the um, well, the Sasanian or early Islamic period. So it's interesting that you have this ancient tr tomb tradition carrying on into the historic period. And I was saying that not much work has been done on these, but we now have this big work done because of the Batana Expressway project, which was this huge construction project along the Batana, and um, large-scale excavation of these tombs. And so this is the first time we have real insight into what's happening in this region. And some of the things that have been found in these tombs are remarkable. Um, we have here a selection, just a small selection, of some of the things that are turning up, which include um, precious metal coinage from the Sasanian world, um, stamp seals in, in precious um, stones, uh, a sword, an iron sword down at the bottom, and um, glass is the most abundant find. These are all things that were not manufactured in, in Oman, not available in Oman. They were coming clearly from the heartlands of the Sasanian Empire. And even up here we have some beads, and, and one there, the sort of slightly unassuming bead there, is actually copal resin from, um, it comes from Zanzibar, comes from East Africa. So these finds are, are, are amazing, and as I was explaining, they occur within these, this ancient tomb tradition that had been around for a very long time. And how do we understand these objects? It's, they open up another kind of angle of interpretation. In a way, they don't tell us what they don't tell me what I want to know, which is about the, uh, the kind of the amount of settlement on the plain, on the Batana plain in the Sasanian period. But they show that at least the probably the semi-sedentary local population were in contact with the Sasanian world and were acquiring these high-value prestige items. Um, and again, this raises the question, how and why are they acquiring these items? <coughs> the most, probably the most likely explanation, again, is in the exploitation of copper, copper resources. Um, you would need uh, a, a workforce who are familiar with the conditions and the environment to, to, to tap into this. I mean, this is just obviously one, one hypothesis, there may be others. So, in sum, we can say that there was um, there are no settlements that have been identified in the Rustak survey, the three big surveys that I talked about. There are no settlements of the late pre-Islamic period, but there is this fine material culture, so there was clearly some kind of relationship. <coughs> so that's the situation on the Batman sort of some of the evidence. And then if, I, if we kind of go back, um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about the, the wider context and then go back in time, what was happening in the kind of lead up, the run up to, to this occupation of Falaise, which we're going to come on to. And 
The reason that I became interested in this project in the first place, I mean, apart from the enjoyment of working in Oman, of course, but the wider sort of intellectual reason was that was part of this um, European Research Council funded project, the Persia and its Neighbours project, which we were involved in. And this project was trying to understand the, the sort of territorial frontiers of the Sasanian Empire and what was happening in the margins of this, of this state structure. And most of our work was in the Northern Territory of the Sasanian Empire. So, um, I don't know, is there a point on this thing? Where it says Gorgan up there, up near the Caspian Sea. This was our first big work, was on the Gorgan Wall, which is this huge defense installation. It's a 200-kilometer um, 200 long brick wall um, built to seal off the, um, the, the, the approach along to the Caspian Sea. Um, into the foothills of the Elbors Mountains. And this is a very rich agricultural zone, so this wall would have um, sealed off this area and allowed the Sasanians to produce huge resources for, for the empire. And if we look much more, if we look a bit more widely across that kind of northern region of the Caucasus um, and northern Iran, northeast Iran, we have these huge um, square campaign bases that were built by the Sasanian Empire in the late Sasanian period. Some of these are colossal. This one, um, Kali Kaligabre near, near Tehran, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, over a kilometre across to walk from, I think, a kilometre and a half to across from one side to the other. It's huge. Um, clearly, they show a pattern. They show a pattern of very substantial investment by the state in defensive works and military infrastructure in the north of Iran at this time. If we think about what's happening in contrast to that in the south, the southern region of the, the Sasanian Empire, the Gulf specifically, and Eastern Arabia, we know far less about this. Um, as I was saying, there's very little archaeological material to go with it. There are no large defensive works like we've been talking about in other areas. There seems to be a sort of open zone in a way. Um, there are clearly interactions, there's clearly involvement, but <coughs> much less obvious investment. <clears throat> and if we go dial back in time a little bit more and think about what's happening in the immediate sort of lead up to the Sasanian period, you have a number of these sites that are um, large and prominent sites from the occupied in the sort of from uh, the late centuries BC to early centuries AD, around the fourth century BC upwards. And actually, I just returned last uh, last week. I was working at this site, Quarit al Fal down in the south of, of Saudi Arabia, and it's an absolutely remarkable site. Um, it's a caravan station situated on the edge of the, the Ruby Rubal Calais, the empty quarter, and um, it's clearly involved in this, this trade of, of frankincense and myrrh incense from, from South Arabia, from Yemen, up along the fringes of the empty quarter and up into the Gulf. Um, that map over there is, is related to Bronze Age trade of the same nature, but, but it, it, it shows the same pattern. And this city, huge city, uh, was occupied and, and abandoned. We can see the abandonment, abandonment of it in the around the third century AD. Another site um, that I've also been working long-term project that I've been doing with the uh, French, uh, the CNRS from France. Uh, we have five years of excavation at this site of Fadj, which is up near Bahrain. It's the largest um, urban site in Eastern Arabia, in Northeast Arabia. Uh, it's a huge walled city, over 40 hectare walled city, with these huge stone defences. You can see up there the excavation and the foundation of these stone defences over four metre thick walls around the city. Um, <clears throat> And again, you know, the same picture, it's, it's flourishing, the city is flourishing in the late centuries BC, early centuries AD, and is abandoned right at the beginning of the Sasanian period. And we can project that out to all of the large and significant sites in the Gulf that are known from this Hellenistic period are all actually abandoned around the same time. Um, we don't know, again, you know, it opens up all sorts of, what's the interpretation of that? Um, I won't go into that, I think I won't go into that now, but the pattern is fairly clear. 
And um, there's been some important work by, by Derek Kennett, who is also the beneficiary of the, the grant for the Rustat project. He's published an important article where he's sort of settling out the fact that this region was in economic decline during the Sasanian period. So the lack of material on the battle is maybe not so surprising. So if we come back, start to focus back in on the, the, the area that we're, we're interested in today, um, <clears throat> I suppose one thing to say is, um, well, one of the, 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 probably the most sort of dominant piece of historical work that has been done on the Hmong was by this man, J.C. Wilkinson, back in the 70s, and he constructed this case to argue that the Batana was extensively cultivated during the Sasanian period. And his argument was based on the existence of these um, the Falaj networks, Falaj irrigation channels, which you could use um, from oral histories, modern oral histories, had a tradition that linked them into the pre-Islamic past. Um, it's been quite widely kind of discredited, that work now. So again, it's sort of reaching the zero point where um, we don't have a lot of material to work with. If we think about the location of Falage, it's situated here about halfway between the mountains and the sea. And I think that location is significant. And as I'm sure you're all aware, you have these hugely contrasting landscapes in Oman, where you have the good provision of water and irrigation, you have lush vegetation and, and um, abundant, um, abundant life. And without it, it becomes a desertic conditions. And on that image, on that satellite image, you can see there's this band of the, the, the distribution of agricultural resources is very much situated along the coastal strip. And I'll come on to that. But that is very much the agricultural zone if we think about the wider landscape, is this area about one or two kilometers from the coast. And in terms of how that was exploited, um, the I suppose, yeah, I can say, so the reason that we have this like, high concentration of, of agriculture along, along the coast is because the water flows out at the bottom of the mountains to the water table, and it's quite, the water table's high at the base of the mountains, but as you enter the, the, the plain, the water table gets deeper and deeper and inaccessible, so that whole middle tract of the plain is very, very hard to irrigate, but the water table comes back up to the surface near the coast. And what they're doing there is exploiting this high water table with these animal-driven um, um, wells, the Zajra wells. And um, we have these littered all along the, the Batman Strip. This is the main way that they're drawing up the water and feeding their fields. Closer to the mountains, you also have these um, phalage systems, which are these ingenious um, underground water systems where you dig a horizontal passage um, to, to, to run the water at a, a, a shallow gradient, and you keep accessing that horizontal channel through these <coughs> vertical wells. And here on the photograph, you can see the upcast of those, those wells. These phalage systems are really important on the Batana as well, but what they're feeding is the, the, the territory close to the mountains. Really, you only want to run them for two or three kilometers max. So places like Rustak, which are close to the mountains, have these phalage irrigation. <clears throat> so just to say, in terms of that, that, that kind of very quick synthesis, um, the location of phalage seems to be out of the agricultural zone, um, up above that area in, in, in the kind of um, the, 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 yeah, the non-irrigated area of open, open landscape. So if we come on to the project itself, um, yeah, really an important part. Of course, um, the, we have all of the kind of academic objectives of the project and the, the reasons which I'm talking to you about today. But a key part of the work is also our investment in um, the future of, of archaeology in the mind. Um, it's really important that we have um, volunteers and, and um, student trace, um, placements in the project. And this collaboration with Sultan Qaboos University 
is really important in terms of that. So I was really pleased that um, this year, this last season that we did in 2022, that we had a good uptake of, of placements. We had um, a junior member from the Ministry of Heritage and Tourism came to join the project, um, Ibrahim Al-Mukbali, and Cal Fal <coughs> a recent graduate from, from um, SQU. So I was very pleased that we, we had that and, um, and we ran a kind of training program within the framework of the project. The site itself. So it is a, um, it's a relatively simple structure, really, and it's a small, relatively simple structure. It's uh, 30 metres by 30 metres fort. It's very well built. I think that's remarkable and noticeable. Uh, it's very regular construction and, and high quality masonry that you can see in the walls. And I think this is quite important in terms of our interpretation that this was built from outside, a uh, force coming from outside Oman. We <coughs> don't find similar architecture in the um, contemporary archaeological record. And actually, the, the plan of this building is, is very typical. Um, this plan of a fort with projecting rounded corner towers and entrance flanking towers is something that is, you can't closely date it, but it's highly typical of the architecture of the um, first millennium AD and across a huge geographic area from, from North Africa to Afghanistan, you find these kind of structures. Um, so at least it places it very, very clearly within that, that bracket. And we've done quite a lot of work immediately around the fort to sort of try to understand um, if there's any contemporary occupation or kind of wider activity connected with it. And we've found a number of things that have interest. A lot of these open water channels running past the, past the fort. Um, for large irrigation, as I was mentioning earlier, and, um, and then a lot of Iron Age occupation that predates our period of interest. But one of the most interesting things that came up was this line with, with these kilns, which are um, 180, um, 180 metres away from the fort to the south, and we found this huge area covered, littered with this vitrified um, clay material. And at the beginning, it was a real puzzle to us what, what this was. We thought maybe it was metal smelting or something. It's clearly an industrial process. But there isn't any slag around. There's nothing to indicate metal production. And actually, after a while, we realized what it is covered in is, is burnt lime. And this is actually very typical. You can see one over here, the floor of one of these lime kilns. And... <clears throat> So what they're doing is they're, um, it's quite amazing if you think about the kind of organisation and planning that went into this fort. It wasn't just going and building it, there was a huge kind of investment that happened before in terms of bringing water, you need water to make lime, so they're bringing um, irrigation to the site, mining the stone, which is locally available, um, acquiring the firewood to burn the lime and preparing it. And the fort itself is, is bound together with lime water which makes it incredibly strong and robust, but it's a huge sort of extra measure to go to in terms of um, constructing this, this robust military structure. <coughs> and if we think about the, how the fort was built, this is still a slightly open question. We kind of, we've been wondering, is, is it, uh, was it all built out of stone? We have these two and a half metre thick stone walls at the foundation. And is the superstructure missing? Has it been robbed out? Um, we started to realise actually if you look at these photos you can see this very level profile across the top of the walls. And I think actually what this is is uh, a stone foundation with a mud brick superstructure which is actually very common as you can see in some of these late Islamic examples, a common building form in, in Oman. And actually in the latest excavations we've started to found, find tumbled mud brick material. So I think we've essentially confirmed this, this hypothesis. And if you think about, um, this is a, a, a fort from Egypt, so <coughs> far away, but it's actually dated to the, the exactly the same period 
and the size is very similar to foliage, and the preservation is, is remarkable in this case, and we can get maybe an impression of the, the sort of size um, and, and uh, scale that, that, that foliage could have been I think, the standard. The dating of the site is, um, is, is really interesting. We have these um, dates coming out, C4 carbon 14 dates coming out in the bottom row. Um, the dating of these is, is sort of early 5th century to mid 6th century AD. It's very hard to narrow beyond that, but at least we can say with high confidence um, that this is, this is, it was built within that frame. Um, this was a, a further sequence on the inside of the, the wall. Again, we have these similar dates that I referred to before. Um, but then we also have some material coming out in the early Islamic period in the 7th and 7th century. So these, those later dates that I've highlighted in, in yellow that are coming out there, they, they were our first indication back in 2015 that there might be something more going on in this site. And actually as we started, as we continued to work, we found more and more traces of this. This is in the entrance way to the fort, and you can see these little blocks that were inserted into the entrance passage, modification to the entrance way to lengthen the entrance passage. And then we started this work up in the northeast corner of the fort in a small area in 2016, and here we found the first traces of internal architecture within the fort. So before then, it had been an empty structure, we found these mud brick walls, which we can see clearly were inserted later. They're not part of the original, the primary construction, the later phase. Um, and uh, an oven, in stone-lined oven in one, one corner of that structure. So we just opened this up in a very small area um, back in 2016. And the date we, we did the C14 dating from this. And some of these dates... Uh, um, well, they all kind of suggest occupation in the 7th century, but there's one here that's absolutely remarkable that's giving 601 to 664. So this is the first half of the 7th century. This is exactly the period when um, we know that the conversion to Islam happened in Oman. And of course, once we had seen this, this was the motivation for coming back and, and wanting to continue the project, which is why we're here. And it's worth just thinking, maybe stepping back a little bit and thinking about what the broader context of this is, which is, as I've outlined a bit earlier, we have this, it comes from the historical record, the idea that the Batana was populated by the Persians, by the Sasanians. It's the, the, the material isn't substantial, but it at least gives us this indication. Um, and that the interior of Oman was left to the affairs of the local Arab population. And in the, um, shortly after the death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632, we have this period of about 10-15 years where the, the Azd tribe, who were the dominant tribe in Oman, convert to Islam or converted to Islam and very rapidly are incorporated into this consolidation of Islam across the Arabian Peninsula, and actually that moment of the conversion of the Yazd in Oman is a kind of key turning point in the success of this Islamic venture, which, which otherwise might not have, 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 have carried on. So this, um, the events in Oman are kind of critical, and the other thing we know is that when the Yazd came to power, the first thing they did was to expel the Persian population through Sohar, and they apparently left on boats and went back to, to Iran. So that's the historical background to what's going on. And um, if you accept my interpretation that this fort was built by the, the late Sasanian Empire, then I think this is the reason why I think we can connect it very clearly with um, this key sort of formational moment in the history of Vermont. In terms of what we did uh, within the fort, I'd like to say, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's very little material culture, disappointingly, within the fort. We were hoping to find lots of, lots of pottery and other things to sort of illuminate what's happening. Maybe it's not surprising, 
it was a military occupation. It was probably kept very clean inside the fort. Um, maybe not a lot of domestic activity. So we've used very intensive um, procedures to try to recover as much as possible. We've sieved everything, all of the, the material, um, and extracted small quantities of very useful material, I'd have to say. Sort of coming back to this fact that there's uh, no previous evidence of Sasanian occupation in Oman, this material that we have is key in terms of diagnosing that, recognising it, and possibly recognising it elsewhere. And we've also done very wide, um, comprehensive environmental studies. Uh, again, with the sieving material, we're extracting seashell, which was exploited as a, as a food resource. And we also have these very small um, land snail shells that come out of the soil. And these are actually really interesting. They um, give you a very precise sort of indication of the environment in that specific place. The snails have a very small range. They, 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 they never travel beyond a few hundred meters within their life. So the existence of um, particular kinds of shells gives you an indication of whether this was a, a sort of vegetated landscape, whether it was irrigated, whether it was open. And actually, the, this study of the snail shells shows us that the conditions at Full Age were similar at the time the fort was built as they are today. That's quite important. The other thing we're doing is um, archaeobotanical analysis. This is a really interesting area of archaeology that's opened up um, really in the last few decades and is, is kind of revolutionising the discipline, I'd say. And what we're doing is um, wet sieving the soil out of the excavations, we're parting, passing it through fine mesh and extracting carbonised plant remains. And so these are the things that people are cooking, that they are preparing. We also have all the wood that they're using as firewood. And from that, we can start to build a, 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 a big picture of, of what people are doing there. One of the most interesting things that came from this archaeobotanical analysis is the find of sorghum. Uh, which is, today, it's the fifth most widely used cereal in the world, which is sort of surprising because it's not something I'm, I'm that familiar with. But um, it's a huge, it's a hugely important um, food resource around the world today. And previously, we, the earliest examples of sorghum in Oman were from the 15th century. We now have evidence of it from the 7th century in the <coughs> early Islamic period. And the importance of sorghum is um, it's a drought-resistant crop and it has a high calorific value. So this could be quite an interesting thing in terms of if the population is under stress, if this is a period of, of huge kind of historical transition, the introduction of this crop <coughs> could be important. And the origin of that crop is India. <coughs> What we've done recently in the 2022 excavation was we went back into that corner that I thought was so interesting where we had this later mud brick architecture and massively opened that area out. Before we only had these tiny indications of the mud brick walls, we now have a, an entire room in the northeast corner of the fort and we have a continuation of that range of rooms going um, towards the entranceway towards the south. We also have stone architecture going the other way. So we can see now, at least, that this later occupation was extensive, it wasn't limited. <coughs> and <coughs> you can see it there in the sand <coughs> and the mud brick walls that we, we've excavated. <coughs> and this is maybe a little bit detailed, but it's, it's actually <laughs> really critical. Is this layer that you can see, this thin layer of highlighted here in, in, in pink. Um, we discovered this season, this, this layer is actually full of glass and Sasanian period material. But critically, it runs underneath the stone wall of the fort. So there was an occupation on this site before the fort was built. And that's something we really need to understand, like why, what it's doing there. One possibility is it could be a sort of labor camp or the people who are involved in the building of the fort but it doesn't make much sense to me if you were going to build a, 
a monumental structure that you would live like in and around the site where you're building this thing. Um, so I think it's more likely that there was some kind of previous phase of activity that we don't yet know about. There could have even been a defence that's now covered by the later one. <clears throat> so if we think about a few of the different factors that I've kind of introduced today, the, the, the big question is, you know, why, what was Falage doing? What was it doing there? This small 30 by 30 metre square fort, clearly defensive, clearly military, very well planned structure. Um, I think there can be no doubt that it has a military function. But would that be, it wouldn't be effective in isolation, this fort. It would only hold maybe 30, 40 um, cavalry or, or, or infantry. And that wouldn't be enough to have any great sort of impact on the, the military control of Badena. So what's it doing there? Um, we have this interesting passage, which I um, talked about a little bit earlier, which is this um, 10th century Omani source that's talking about events three or four hundred years earlier than the time that it's reporting. And it's talking about this situation I described, this sort of partition of the coast and the interior. And actually, this is the key source that, that everybody has sort of based their understanding <coughs> of, um, of, of this division that we talked about. So could Falage be, you know, the kind of confirmation of this, uh, this passage? Could it be part of a, um, a chain of forts, say, along the back of the Batana? This would make very good strategic sense in terms of the defence of it's out of the agricultural zone, it's similar to the situation you find in Roman Limes systems, where again they're often not in the, the most rich areas of cultivation, they're behind that area. Um, I think that's the most sort of uh, persuasive explanation. But then if that's the case, then why, why, why haven't we found more? Coming back to those three big surveys that I talked about um, right at the beginning, in a way, you'd almost think that they rule out the possibility of uh, there being a chain of forts along the Batna, <coughs> because those two surveys, they deliberately made a transect from the mountains to the sea, and neither of them have found further examples of Fort Lake for Ledge. But actually, when you unpack that material and look in a little bit more detail, you know, this is the Rustak survey, and um, you know, it has this large pink square I put on the, on the presentation, but actually if you look at it, it's divided into smaller zones that were, were surveyed and investigated, which is a totally reasonable sampling strategy. But in terms of what we want to understand, it sort of misses out the key fort zone, which is this um, area in the middle of the battle and the plain that we really want to understand. Likewise, the Wadi Jizi survey, very extensive, but it's really focusing on Bronze Age funerary archaeology and it wasn't really um, concerned with, with this period. And I suspect if you look at their survey in detail, you'd find a similar sunken strategy. So, there are lots of open questions, as there normally are in archaeology. Um, but, of course, what's key behind um, what could answer this, what really could answer this, is the investigation of Sohar, back to the point where I started. And we clearly know that Sohar, from the historical material, was occupied in the pre-Islamic period. Um, attempts have been made to, to unearth that in the 1980s. I think we have many more technologies available now that would help us to hone in more quickly on what we're actually looking for. It's not a small undertaking, it's a, um, it's a large, very large settlement, mount, eight metres high. Um, as I said, it's covered in a lot of modern urban development. But fortunately for archaeology, we don't actually need a very large area to explore, we only need a, a window into that mound. And there are such windows in open parkland and so on. And so, yeah, it's very exciting to announce that we're actually starting some, some new work at Sohar this year. We're going to conduct a pilot expedition there, um, 
again, supported by the Anglo Mining Society. And we're very much hoping that this is going to develop into a large scale, long term project. And um, yeah, I hope you see from, from what I explained right at the beginning, given the kind of critical importance of SOHAR, that this is a project that has resonance and significance way beyond the mine. It's something that people would be majorly interested in and would um, gain huge attraction and support in terms of scientific interest. And <clears throat> I suppose the other thing to say in terms of um, it has a scientific interest, but I think we can do way more than that. Um, there's a really clear need in Oman today to develop a capacity in historic archaeology. Most of the remains that the Ministry of Heritage and Tourism have to look after and, and manage are from the Islamic period. Yet there's no expertise in Oman in this period. Um, there's been a huge focus on prehistoric archaeology, from the Bronze Age and the sort of spectacular finds from the Iron Age. And there are kind of historical reasons why that's the case. But there's been a major emphasis on prehistoric archaeology. There's no chair in the Sultan Qaboos University, there's no position teaching in historic archaeology. There's no specialist within the Ministry of Heritage and Tourism covering this period. So I, I, think, I think this is a, I mean, I think they recognize this themselves, but this is a, a gap that really needs to be like, quite urgently filled. So I think the investigation of SOHA will be a major launch pad to both to build this capacity and to achieve something really significant in a modern and long term Anglo money research collaboration. Thank you. Consultant to uh, Paolo Costa. Oh, great. This is a quick who we mentioned, or at least up there. Yes, yes. Um, and on the Battle of the, fort, uh, the Coast, there was one fort that I put in my report as probably having a moat. Yes. Um, I can't remember the name of it. We're talking about mid 70s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Bahrain and I was the architect to the Ministry of Information. And all the rest there, mm -hmm. and excavated after Monique, okay. uh, um, Arad Fort, where I did discover a moat, yes. which was filled by the aquifers. <coughs> mm -hmm. Now, going back to the butter, yes. the aquifers were going down and being filled up with seawater and being destroyed. Mm -hmm. But have you actually, I mean, the, the, the fort that I saw, and mm -hmm. I can't remember the name of it, but I could get my report and see mm -hmm. where my drawings were. But it looked as though it had a moat. Have you found anything like that? Walking around the Batana? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, 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 um, the, the, one, the fort that you talk about, yeah, it's reported by, by Paolo Costa, as you say. And um, I know the one you're referring to with, with the moat, and his, his sort of uh, hypothesis on that was that it wasn't filled with water in that case, that it was a dry moat. It probably, probably was, but I probably disagreed with me. I suppose it could expose the cracks already. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's the fort that you referred to is part of this phenomenon that we find, uh, I think he documented over 90 of these structures along the Batana the coast. And they're dated to the, the 18th to 20th centuries, the saw. Um, uh, these, um, but also the plans, the plans that you show are the ones that you find in Palestine, uh, near Tiberias, you find them in Transjordan. They are early Islamic forts. And also your exactly. brick that you uh, show hmm. um, uh, extends down to certainly Zanzibar, yep. extends up into. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm on one of my horses. But it, 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 it extends all the way through Iran, uh, uh, the desert areas in Transjordan, throughout the whole of um, Saudi Arabia and that whole area. 
And the earliest example of that technique is actually in Kalata the, yeah. the, the, the the stonework of Kalata next door to the one you just the, the small color. Yeah, I think I put up the example from Kalata Bakhre. Right, the, the, like, yeah. the Danish uh, yeah. Sorry, I will shut up. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, good question. Yes. Um, to, to two unrelated questions. Uh, the word foliage, yes. the name foliage, uh, means the diminutive, diminutive of phalage. Yeah. Um, could you re explain that um, in relation to a phalage or whatever? Mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, you did work with the European um, archaeological team at the beginning. Now it's British. Could you sort of explain? The, uh, the, the, the that sure um, yeah so the name comes as you say it's the um, phalage is the diminutive of phalage and uh, the site is next to phalage al Haf, which is a, a, a village probably founded in the late Islamic period around the 17th century that has a, a running phalage system irrigating it um, so the name is, is, is because of the proximity of this other village um, and I suppose smaller phalage, phalage networks close to it. Did your fault have a phalage? Yes, it had one running past it. And um, actually we've done some really interesting work on the phalage systems and the open irrigation channels. And we've used this very like um, kind of modern and advanced dating technique, um, cell optically stim stimulated luminescence dating, that can now date um, sediments and when they were laid down in water systems. And um, <coughs> disappointingly, they come out in the late Islamic period, these, these water channels. <laughs> so they're not actually directly related to the fort. Um, but anyway, I mean, these systems can be reused many times and there's a lot of complexity. So at least we're sort of starting to unlock the story of those. Um, in terms of the European to British angle, um, uh, so the project was, um, when it started off in 2015, it was part of this really big project, the Persia and its Neighbours project, funded by the European Research Council. And we were looking at the whole frontier region of the Sasanian Empire, and um, mostly in the north, um, but this area down in the south of Oman, that, that, that was also um, relevant within what we were trying to do. But that project came to an end in 2017, and at that point we'd found this sort of tantalising glimpse of what was in the northeast corner of the, the fort with these um, early Islamic dates. So we were really glad that we could we could come here and that the Anglo Mining Society could support the continuation of the work. And so now it's under a new guise, but it's still an international project. It's a very international project with many people from, from around the world joining it. Can I ask, and ha having a fort on the Bartona Plain between the coast and the mountains, that's not a big surprise, is it, given that there were you know, routes, people were regularly moving from the coast to the interior in, in recent times, at least carrying dry fish and so on. So having a, a fortification at that location even sort of 1,500, 2,000 years ago. It's not a big surprise, is it? Um, yeah, no, I agree. I think the, the location is very logical. It's, um, you wouldn't really want this fortification in the key agricultural zone near to the coast. Uh, if it's going to protect that zone, you want it removed from that and in this open territory. Um, but, you know, we're thinking about all the sort of locational factors that could be important. It's next to a big wadi channel, um, but as you know, there are many. Um, I mean, that's the typical sort of form of the Batana, these big braided water channels. And the channel that it's next to isn't a particularly significant one in terms of its access into the interior. So it doesn't seem to be guarding a communication route. One other, I think actually quite likely possibility is that it, it could be involved in the exploitation of mining resources again. And just up behind the ledge, uh, we've done some survey work and found actually that one of the slides I showed showed this uh, mining settlement that's um, 
has these uh, workers' huts. It's high up in the mountains, and it has a, a ruined village still there in amongst the slag heaps. Um, all the pottery from there shows 9th, 10th century activity, which is typical, connected with the, the, the flourishing of Sohar. But you'd need to do more work there to see if it has a, a kind of earlier um, development. Oh, yeah. Um, you uh, glossed over very quickly um, uh, why everything deteriorated in the third century AD. Yeah. Now that we have time, can you just quickly say what your view is on why that was? <laughs> Put me on the spot. Yeah. Um, it's pretty good. Why? Um, I suppose there's quite a lot of factors. So. A lot of these cities that I <laughs> referred to at the beginning, like these large cities in Saudi Arabia that we've been working on, have been around for a very long time by that point. Um, the site of Fajr near Bahrain had over 800 years of occupation on this one site. It's a very large city. And I guess we know now from history that, that, that cities have a kind of um, uh, use life for, you know, at some point they expire, or maybe the local resources are uh, drained and exploited and, um, and it will come to an end. But why do all of the cities collapse at the same time? Um, I suppose my, I think it might be, may well be connected with the beginning of the Sasanian period. I think that the whole kind of structure of trade in the Gulf at that time changes. These cities that were in Eastern Arabia are based on this overland trade of aromatics from South Arabia up into the Gulf, um, into Mesopotamia and, and, and through to like Palmyra and the Eastern Mediterranean. And this trade network that existed before was, I think, completely overturned and, and transformed at the beginning of the Sasanian period and they, they really lost their relevance at that time. So I think that's the, the, the sort of bigger explanation. And so then you have a gap of about 200 years before something like Well, the next, actually it's longer. So the next real flourishing that we see is in the, around the 7th century, the beginning of the Islamic period. And uh, we're doing a lot of work on that. Um, uh, there's a lot of these um, uh, churches, actually, um, monastic institutions built along the southern shore of the Gulf from the 7th century um, and other settlements. That's the next period where we see a boom in settlement. So it's quite a long period of um, 400 years. <coughs> Any more questions? Seth, thank you very much indeed for coming tonight. And a fascinating uh, articulation of both Sohar and Falaise and all the fantastic work you've been doing. Yeah. What I find really interesting is actually the linkage between a number of the lectures we've had over the uh, last few months. Indeed, uh, His Excellency Syed al Marwali, when he came to be our a uh, guest at the annual lunch was telling me that he'd just been down a copper mine with Mohammed Al Kindi, who came to the RGS, and now that links into Flesh. So there's a linkage all the way across there. But thank you so much for bringing to life uh, all the huge work you've done in both Flesh and Sahar. And we look forward to hearing more about your forthcoming exhibition in January, yeah. and uh, especially to hear how your ideas and research into Sohar developed. So thank you very much indeed. Please join me. Yeah.